Great, thank you, Wendy. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, a pleasure to have two great panelists and to talk about a topic that's very important. Let me just say a few words about GuideHouse. Um, we're a large global consulting firm that provides advisory digital managed services to both the commercial and public sectors. There are about 16 and a half thousand employees at GuideHouse. Um, as mentioned, we serve both the government, uh, health systems, um, payers as well. We uh, recently named the uh, rank the second largest healthcare consulting firm in the US. Um, and in addition to that, we have our large government practices mentioned. A number of class number one rankings are shown on this slide as well. So a large multidisciplinary uh, consulting firm with a major footprint in healthcare, and we're absolutely delighted to be part of this series. So let me move on from that and just introduce our two panelists today that we're very fortunate to have. Um, the first one is Ted Day, who is Executive Vice President for Strategic Planning and Business Development at University Health in San Antonio. He's worked there for the past 10 years. Uh, Ted is a 25-year veteran of the healthcare industry. He served in diverse leadership roles across the industry, including in large health systems, multi-specialty physician practices, and payer organizations. At University Health, he's responsible for a range of organizational functions, including helping to set and execute the strategic direction of the organization in concert with the leadership team. It's a very strong leadership team there as well. Uh, he oversees such key system growth uh, and partnership functions as business and affiliation development, regional outreach development, strategic reporting, electronic clinical connectivity to the private practice community and physician and joint venture contracting. And our other panelist is Dr. Art Savidra, who is presently the Dean and Executive Vice President for Medical Affairs uh, at the uh, VCU, Virginia Commonwealth University uh, School of Medicine and Health System. After he graduated uh, from Harvard College with a degree in biologic sciences, and then uh, went to University of Pennsylvania, where he received both an MD and a PhD degree with specialized training in pharmacology. He then went back to Boston, where he was resident and chief resident in internal medicine at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, and then moved on and did another residency, uh, the Harvard's Combined Dermatology Residency Program. Uh, he then joined the faculty at uh, Harvard and uh, was serving as vice chair for clinical affairs and medical director in the Department of Dermatology at Massachusetts General Hospital. He was then recruited to the University of Virginia School of Medicine as the professor and chair in dermatology. And while he was at UVA, served as the president and interim CEO of their faculty practice plan, their university physicians group. And then as mentioned, he's recently moved to VCU where he's Dean of the School of Medicine and Executive Vice President for Medical Affairs for the health system. So with that introduction, these wonderful panelists will move on to a set of questions uh, that the two panelists will discuss and then there'll be time at the end for question and answer with all of you. And I know that the group that's on the line is not shy at all. And uh, there'll be adequate time for back and forth with our panelists and with each other as well. So if we can move to the first question um, here, which is looking at today's post-pandemic world, what has changed regarding your uh, clinical operational financial strategies and what you see across the landscape for essential hospitals as well as you talk to your colleagues and other health systems, both those who belong to uh, AEH, essential hospitals, but those uh, in other settings as well, because I believe there's a commonality of issues here. So we'll start with you, Ted. Uh, great, good afternoon. Thanks, um, Ed. and. Um, 
pleasure to visit with you all. I'm going to add one quick uh, anecdote or takeaway at the beginning and then make some comments here. So we um, at University of Health have a change campaign, which is an outward facing campaign for consumers. And it's challenging consumers on how they should introduce positive change in their lives. But the reason I start off with that is I think we as healthcare leaders can also um, focus on how we're making sure we're adapting uh, to changes around us. I'll throw in a quick analogy and then give a specific answer to your question, Ed. So um, some of you may have seen My Octopus Teacher. If you haven't seen that, I encourage you to look at it. It's a Netflix um, documentary about an octopus off the shore in the cold waters in the kelp forest in South Africa. And uh, some of you are nodding uh, with resonance on that. So uh, the octopus you learn in that is an amazingly adaptable creature. And so I'm throwing that in at the beginning as an encouragement for all of us to have some kind of metaphor that we're going to remember that causes that reminds us we need to change. So that example, he'll cover himself with shells to hide in the middle of plain sight. He'll squish into the smallest place possible. And when he's uh, running from a shark, he's so adept at to uh, attaching himself to the shark's back to hide from the shark. So I encourage you all to think that way. In a specific answer to the question, there are a lot of different ways we could go here. I'll throw in a few and then turn it over to um, uh, my colleague to share as well. One thing that we're finding is operationally, we need to pivot for the pent up demand in our community. So that's partly post COVID, partly um, growth. We have a dramatic geographic growth in our catchment area. And then we also find uh, that we have a lot of higher acuity patients due to the previous causes and just other things, aging of the population, et cetera. So one of our biggest challenges is to build more capacity. We have, we have no shortage of healthcare demand, and so we need to be very creative on building capacity. One way we're doing that is reusing space. We found hospital at home to be a particularly helpful initiative. We've um, built that ourselves, and I think there was even a presentation previously at the AEH on that. We run an average daily census of about 20 every day on that. And, uh, and looking at other ways, we're also building more physical capacity, new campuses. One is opening uh, next month and things like that. So that's my initial answer to that. I'll turn it over to. Others. That's terrific. <clears throat> Art? Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. And, and thank you for the opportunity to learn from your questions in, in the later half of the hour. Um, Thank you to my colleague for, for sharing the octopus analogy and, and focusing on, on the ex, uh, need for extra capacity. I'll use that analogy also and then take the perspective of, of our labor force, right? Um, when we look at our financials, it's very clear that the labor expense is, is high and increasing. The war on talent continues and um, it's not sufficient to care for people. We have to care about people. And that means our patients, our workforce, our employees. And you see the octopus only has eight tentacles and it's trying to hold 10 balls up in the air. And so we've had to really be very thoughtful and strategic about number one, how do we really create an, um, uh, an environment and bring in people to those environments that are just so dedicated to mission so that there are no surprises about what essential hospitals do. And then beyond that, understanding as well what keeps them here and how we engage them. After the pandemic, we've noticed an incredible interest in, in shared decision making, in governance, in thinking about strategy, in thinking about vision, but always phrasing um, our, our mission as the upfront answer to just about any questions. For example, we start every meeting in the physician's group rereading our mission statement. When complicated questions come up, we rephrase, are we answering this question from that content? Because we know that post-pandemic, people have made decisions very differently than they have before. Some people have decided to become one-income families. Others have decided to work part-time. Otherwise, other people have chosen different environments. So again, how do we use that octopus analogy to teach us? How do we balance the portfolio that people are handling? How do we keep people here rather than continuously you know, um, cycle? But also how to learn from our own workforce about 
are we meeting our mission and how we should um, move forward. Part of that answer has been technology, but it hasn't been the entire answer. I think people want FaceTime with the patient and to the extent that technology can do things that people shouldn't, we, we found that to be the case, but not at the exclusion of more time or FaceTime with the patient. We've learned that um, we have to be very mindful with um, no single point of failure. So looking at all our suppliers, so we have at least two, right, of each of, of them. Um, and then with that, every financial engagement that we take really looks at a, a second option and a risk mitigating uh, step to that regard. Um, but thank you for the question. So just a little follow on to this, um, for both of you in terms of your workforce, We've heard about emerging technology, the importance of the workforce, the desire of healthcare providers, not just physicians and not just nurses, but across the spectrum to have that face time to take care of patients. But we hear a lot of concern about the financial aspects of personnel. It's a huge cost for health systems. So how are you both addressing that? And, uh, you're asking uh, Ted, all the you're asking all the easy questions. Okay. Uh, well, I thought I'd start, I start really easy and then we're gonna get harder, right? Yeah, right, right, no problem. No, uh, workforce is probably the beginning and end of conversation and many conversations <laughs> these days. So there are uh, a lot of different elements. You mentioned the financial piece, that's a challenge. We have to figure out how to create savings elsewhere in order to keep the workforce in place. And also the supply cost, as, was, as Art mentioned a little bit ago, um, so we have the, the twin challenges of that, but I would expand it a little bit beyond that. So we're basically budgeting, simple answer is we're budgeting for that and knowing that that expense is increasing, but also um, retention, stating the obvious retention is much cheaper than uh, recruiting and training a new workforce. Just had a conversation about a key physician uh, who's changing positions and lamenting uh, what the retraining uh, element is for that, for leadership in there or on the administration side as well. We've had an interesting dialogue recently here at University Health about um, understanding generational differences and um, how we need to modify our thinking as Gen Z becomes a greater and greater percentage of the workforce. We've got an interesting speaker, Jason Dorsey. I encourage people to uh, look up his YouTubes and maybe even engage him to come speak to your management and your physician leadership on understanding the different uh, the different expectations of our younger workers and how we can relate to each other among the three or four generations we have serving five generations of patients. So a lot of, lot of layers to that question. Great, thank you. Art? Yes, I would say that, um, yes, this is one of the items that takes most of our strategic time but I think it's also an incredible opportunity for innovation, right? I think at the early first step, you think about scopes of practice and purifying, right? Um, making sure that people work on top of license and that's probably not a secret or an incredible insight. But what is, is the following. I think if we look at all the things that we have to do every day in healthcare to meet our patients' needs, we often think about how we staff those needs with workforce rather than how we involve the patient in some of those tasks. For instance, it's probably time to think about medical reconciliation. Is that best done at the clinic visit or can it be done at home when you're at your medicine cabinet? So how do we engage the patient in functions that we know are timely, expensive, and maybe not the favorite of our workforce, but could be done in higher fidelity areas? Another example is um, we can really learn um, from other countries around um, community engagement and function. Sometimes our higher utilizing patients don't necessarily need complexity of care, even though we call it that. They need, com they need help navigating a complex system. We, in a different institution, uh, created a, um, a protocol where we hired folk that we called patient um, advocates. And really what they did was to remind patients of their appointments, to help find transportation if that was an issue, um, to help with communication, with filling out financial forms. And, and we learned that if the nurse or the patient or the front the staff of the hospital didn't have to do that, we had greater patient satisfaction and greater provider satisfaction. 
So then how do we use this tough area of expense to be innovative and to challenge our workforce? Workflow is, is really the exercise, in my opinion. Great. If we can go on to the next question, <clears throat> we hit another one that's, uh, you know, very easy, Ted. And Art, we'll let Art start with this one, give you time to think about it. How is your competitive position in the marketplace and your relationship with physician partners changed from how it was pre-pandemic? And, you know, we use the pandemic here as sort of a watershed event, but it's really more than that. There's been a continuous evolution starting before the pandemic around uh, the relationship with house systems, with physician partners, how systems with physician groups, including those now that are being bought up by uh, payers such as Optum and United, private equity buying physician groups as well, and then of course, consolidation of physician groups. So Art? Yes, thank you for that question. And I think this gets to the very issue of identity and what we are as essential hospitals. Um, sometimes we're a victim of our own success. You know, and it is often said, you know, you can't be everything to everyone, but but our identity perhaps is trying to do so. And it's really um, in this period that we've been challenged to think about co-opetition, really, with other areas in the community, whether it be other health centers, whether it be community centers, um, frankly, where it be PE-based, you know, uh, specialist firms, and how we really think about um, synergisms that bring us up all in the same direction. I think physicians like engaging in that conversation, particularly those that often find the need to diversify their activities, their method of employment. Um, and, and to the point that my colleague has raised, you know, the New England Journal of Medicine has told us the cost of having to replace a physician rather than retain that physician. And it has several zeros around it. So, so that competitive landscape may be is to our advantage to provide a diversified experience for our workforce and in turn retain them. I do think, however, we are also finding the greatest um, uh, tension to be the strategy in primary care versus subspecialist post pandemic. And they are not exactly the same in terms of at least the local competition in Virginia. Um, and so we're, we're finding that we have to be really thoughtful about how we think of those as almost two service lines in spite of thematic um, influence, but more in the way that we grow them, in the way that we interact in the market, and frankly, how we recruit and particularly retain those physicians. We've learned that um, particularly primary care really wants to be engaged in value-based strategy and care redesign, very much so, and not involving them, I think, is a mistake. On the other hand, specialists really want to learn how to be part of the capital budgeting <laughs> process? How do we have access to the important technologies that will drive front-end care and not make us feel that we're providing substandard care in an essential hospital? So, so they are, those are generalities, but sometimes understanding really how to engage people in their context of work as, has been really a competitive advantage in the marketplace. Thank you. Ted? Uh, thank you. Those are great um, comments, Art, and I'll make uh, some different ones to complement what you've talked about, you know, interestingly, um, our organization has seen a change in how the community views us, and I'll not make it all about us, but I'll just use it for illustration. So if you have, if you respond well to a crisis like the pandemic, then you have people pay attention to you who heretofore might not have done so as much. So uh, we had a very robust response, leveraged Epic to do that. So prove the power of Epic and uh, also the power of organization. We did like 600,000 uh, vaccines given during that window of time. And I just use that as background to say it opened up dialogue for folks and changed a little bit of the equation of competitive position. So what that means is we have new conversations uh, with physicians that were more community focused and not really interested in interacting with the AMC as much. But as you grow in that uh, sense and you become more outwardly focused and less of a self-contained system, like many um, safety net systems are, then you can uh, really involve yourself in the community decision-making. I appreciate 
Art's comments about the desire to be at the table on forming that, we're seeing that as well, as well as even giving input on when you build out new facilities, what that might look like and what services are needed in what area. So having a posture of asking a lot of open-ended questions to a physician community that you've not had such dialogue before is really a, a winning strategy. Uh, and then I think there's a question coming up later on the survival of physician groups and facilities. So that's a dynamic locally, and it probably is in a lot of our markets. Uh, so that's, a, I guess, a teaser of an answer to a future question. <laughs> it's always good to know where it's coming. Um, just a quick follow-up. Both of you uh, have destination programs. You also have your own employed physicians. And then clearly you have referring physicians too. Can you talk a little bit about the balance there? Um, there are clearly other house systems that are trying to get those referred patients as well. And there's a difference in the relationship between your own physicians, your own uh, practice plan, and, and those that are circulating around you. So maybe Ted first. Uh, yeah, that's a great follow-up question, and I think the answer is it uh, is variable over time. It's interesting to see um, the choices that physicians are making to the point you made when you framed this question in the beginning, Ed, of uh, if I'm an independent physician or part of a group, am I going to continue in that vein? Am I going to join a, a health system? More than 50% of physicians are employed by health systems, and a growing percentage are employed by Optum or even a venture capital group. So if you're going to align yourself, what are you going to do? But um, can you um, retain your autonomy? So that's the dialogue. That's my answer to your question. Is Great, how much thanks. autonomy do you get? It, it goes to Art's question or point about um, your identity as a physician. So a lot of conversations along those and people are willing to consider different models or even a lease arrangement or things like that. Very dynamic time in that space. Art? Yes, I just add also that um, just like with any other portfolio, having, um, you know, different group settings for practice and different employment models is actually a plus. For example, there are definitely classes of physicians that are more willing to innovate and, and be part of new technologies, others that are more comfortable with high complexity care at lower volumes, others that are high volume and so on and so forth. Some that are more likely to bring in telemedicine into the mix as well. And so sometimes adjusting the, the setting on which this practice is as important as the employment model, because it is those metrics again, that, that indicate to the doctor that they are in fact, still having some level of independence and operational control. I will add that operational control over their practice. Yeah, so it's it's not for them actually having input, right? And not just being a cog, but actually having their voice heard as well. If we can go on to the next question, which is what other trends and approaches would you suggest that leaders explore when developing their organization's financial stability plan? I guess, Ted, we can start with you here. Okay, sure. Um, this is a big question. I'll throw in comments that are like the bookends on this <laughs> from, a, um, from uh, an AEH perspective. So given the, the fact that our members have the mission that they do and the position that they do has been mentioned before. Um, so we are the benefactors of um, supplemental funding programs. So that's the good news. The challenge is, as we know, is you can get an email at five o'clock on a Friday, which is common either from CMS or from the state, uh, changing uh, the funds flow on that or the rules or things like that. It's, I'm only slightly facetious in that. It's a very changing dynamic. So uh, leadership has been strong here, and I'm sure as in uh, arts institution and others represented here on focusing on on that and paying attention to where the puck's gonna be here shortly. The other thing that we have to also keep in mind though is the disruptors, which we've been a little bit insulated from, but that won't be true forever, right? You have Amazon buying One Health and promising that they're gonna make the doctor's visit very different in the future than it was in the past. 
Village Medical, Walgreens, Walmart, they all want to do a different model, and some of them will execute well on that. So that's going to take some of our uh, increase the competition on some of our outpatient activity. Um, so I'll pause. I'll pause with that or stop with that. Great, <clears throat> Art. Yes, yeah, so I will say to this question that one of the most important things in really thinking about the future is to be the flexible octopus that Ted has told us to be. So before something hits you, um, piloting things, right? So that you know what may work, what doesn't work, what will need uh, improvement, right? And whether that's at the level of care models or corporate practice, I think it's equally important to model. I'll give you an example. We continue to, to play with different contracting forms and engaging with government and payers in, in different ways, but there is a role for artificial intelligence and predictive analytics there. So how do we pilot that to learn its capabilities rather than fear it? The second is um, to, the, to the goal of financial stability. I do think that operational improvements are, are a mindset, not just a business competency. So just when you think something's perfectly operationalized, there's always room. So we continue to look at our revenue cycle over and over and over, and we continue to find ways of aligning it, realigning it, or simply just doing it differently. And I would say third, um, what we have found is that there is an incredible need for discipline in financial stability. It is often easier to, to get excited about doing something new and adding on and perfecting, and it's an entirely different exercise to stand down things. <laughs> That are not working, cleaning up technologies that are not being used but still require maintenance, time, and cost. So I do think it's looking at both sides of the equation: the exciting end of adding and the disciplined end of saying no or this is not working. That that we continue to fine tune in our financial strategy. So let me just ask a question. I'll start with you, Art, um, and then we'll go to Ted. How much do you have to keep in house? versus contracting out. And where does that play a role here as well, particularly for back office kind of functions? I think that's a great question. And often I think that's a, a varied, um, varied question to answer depending in your environment. And what do I mean by that? I do think that there are corporations that yes, may help us as a vendor to do things that we don't know how to do well but we still need to learn a lot about it to make sure that the partnership is, is good. So, so what I caution isn't whether you use vendors or not, but whether do you have the internal capabilities to, to learn and to audit and to continue to influence that as it relates to the greater whole. I, I have seen, for example, um, two, I've lived in two different institutions, one that has almost entirely removed the revenue cycle out to vendor and another one that consolidated in, in, in an effort to keep those fees internally. And, you know, both have been successful for different reasons. Um, but the decision is made, I think, um, understanding your own business competencies and your ability to influence the process internally. And not every institution is at the same place with the same talent and in the same journey of interacting with vendors. Great. Ted? Yeah, I think that's very well put. Um, and I think the principle that we should apply over what uh, Art is describing is ultimately it's, uh, it's our accountability to make sure it's successful, right? So you evaluate your core competencies, your relative cost of doing it yourself versus outsourcing, but we all on this call can cite examples where we've outsourced something or we've had a vendor work with us and they haven't done a great job and we've had to fire them or change it, uh, but we at least we were paying attention, right? So in general, um, if you can own it and do it successfully and do it at a reasonable cost, you should keep it. But uh, there's such a diverse um, suite of services that we're doing as large complex institutions that we have to evaluate that carefully and then have the discipline to know uh, whether it's working or not and not be afraid of uh, undoing it, giving it to somebody else or taking it back. Great, thank you. Um, let's move on to another question. We'll start with you for this one, Art. Um, have fiscal pressures at other hospitals and health systems in your community created more pressure and impacted your organization's service availability? 
So this is shifting of service lines, shifting of patients, um, shifting of patients with various insurance or lack thereof to you uh, between the hospitals. So one aspect of this is, of course, the clinical services you provide. The other is the patient population you serve. So Art? This is my favorite question because it gets to the point again of co opetition and how do you exist in the marketplace um, while being a good neighbor um, and while, you know, quite frankly, thriving as well. And one of the changes we have noticed is that a lot of our uh, surrounding partners slash competitors um, are um, more able to open and close services given their corporate structure. And so when things are not working well and a service is closed, we immediately have to stand present to, to, to take care of the population that otherwise doesn't have that service. So we live in a constant state of really readjusting to what others are doing, to the potential of COP you know, and applications, to who's building what, um, and to sort of predict at what expense are they building that? What's, what's coming down? Because that's what, you know, what we're gonna have to um, take care of. So I think that's one issue, really um, being very aware of the market all the time so that we can respond to, to the patient's benefit. I think the other um, pressures that are very, very significant in, in our marketplace relate to what patients really want from us. And it changes from time to time. I think that as an academic institution, we've been used to hearing a lot about our subspecialty services and how to accommodate that when it's not available. But boy, are we hearing a lot about primary care as well, right? Probably even more than we ever have. And so how do we really adjust to that pressure by creating new partnerships with, with partners that maybe we didn't think of before? Like my colleague has mentioned, right? The Walgreens of the world, patient first and others. Um, and the details are what make it difficult, right? The value proposition is not so complicated. How do you exchange information, right? Whether that's laboratory medications, when you engage with a partner like that, number one, how do you provide an experience that is actually seamless for the patient and you don't confuse them or contradict them in care? And finally, how do you really think about what, a, what is a strategic partnership? Is it just access? Maybe. Is it quality? <laughs> Again, is it information technology? So it really makes you evaluate the environment first, but try, try to predict it before it's changing. Great, thank you. Ted? I'm gonna uh, appreciate all those comments. I'm gonna go to the question that wasn't asked before this, and that's how you serve your community and then deal with the changes in the community that create the pressures that are built into this question. Great. So I think, I uh, speak sitting in San Antonio, which is one of the uh, communities in the country, not the only one by a long stretch that has some of the greatest health disparities, even within the same county. And so there's a lot of dialogue here, and I'm sure in all the markets that are represented by folks on this call and others who will listen on how we're trying to meet needs, uh, generally for patient populations, many of whom are underserved. And so uh, that's already a theme. Um, we're finding that we're putting more and more emphasis on public health, which is part and parcel of what everyone is doing. We're making it a very formal here in this market due to a variety of considerations. But that happens pre-pandemic, during pandemic, and then in post-pandemic. That's why some of the ARPA funds were made available by the government to address the post-pandemic stress on the community that was already underserved and then is in even worse shape. But to this question, some other hospitals um, are uh, feeling the pressure or they're not surviving, right? And so that's probably the main theme of the question. So we're dealing with both of those. And then um, fortunately, we have a collaborative community in this area and we have quote unquote community responses to significant events like this. If some services are closed down, okay, how can we get together and kind of all share the challenge and make sure patients and staff um, are addressed in that. Um, so that represents kind of recent events, and but it, thematically it fits with how we respond to pressure when it comes up and doesn't really go away. It just varies in source and time, I suppose. Great. 
let's um, move to the next question because I think, yeah, this is exactly where I wanted to go because it reflects what's going on with payers and in particular with Medicaid. And it's how is your organization preparing as populations move off Medicaid post COVID? Uh, for AEH hospitals in particular, this is a major factor in terms of patient care and finances. So Ted, we'll start with you for this one. Sure, happy to comment on it. And in our organization and maybe true for others, you see this from both directions. So we have a large community health plan that's part of our family of organizations. So we're seeing uh, folks moving off the rolls of Medicaid because of the uh, changes in Texas, they're uh, well through that process. They've uh, crossed the first bridge of three, and they're finding that fewer and fewer are qualifying than were before. So you address that on the health plan side. It's a direct financial impact because you have less premium revenue on that side. But then on the other side, too, I think the point of the question on the clinical enterprise side, you just are aware of the fact that folks are maybe we're on Medicaid and now are qualifying for your charity plan. So we're very proactive about trying to determine who they are. We run a large successful Kennedy indigent program and really try to catch them there. Uh, and then just know that some of our quote unquote uninsured that may or may not qualify for that charity program are increasing. We need to uh, be able to uh, address that. Great. Thanks, Art. Thank you for this question. I think this is a, a a complicated question with, with a lot of important points to talk about. I think at the very um, basic, really understanding your heart verification and you know the way that you schedule and, and register patients is, is really important. You know, you, sometimes we um, don't understand who's in our system until they are in a system far into extended therapy. I think it forces us to really be thoughtful about our high utilizers and how we stabilize that, that group. It's more important than ever now to keep people healthy and away from the hospital. And that means, again, not just looking at home care and telemedicine, but really being very, very thoughtful about your ER strategy, particularly in the emergency room. Um, because, you know, you want to make sure you stabilize how, how people present to the emergency room. External factors, like how you grow, and that growth requires capital is, is important, not just to diversify the entry there, but to also understand the processes that operationalize keeping people healthy in various different communities. And lastly, I will say probably something a little bit untraditional, but communities are more engaged than ever in understanding these issues. And there is a role for, for communal philanthropy um, in, in helping us organize around those who aren't as fortunate. Um, uh, and so really engaging not just the community and our grateful patients, but, but those who are successful, right, in other ways in the area and are very invested in the care of communities is really paramount. It's almost impossible to do with that kind of feedback and frankly, financial resource. I wonder, in both of your situations, what is the role of managed Medicaid? And how are you addressing that? Is that a major factor for you? Uh, it is for us. So the example I cited is we are an example of a managed Medicaid plan. Uh, Texas has taken the philosophy to push as many Medicaid uh, beneficiaries to uh, manage plans as possible because they they can shift the risk onto those folks and they've done it successfully. So it's mostly that in that space. Yeah, it is important for us a little less so given how Virginia funds its Medicaid and the contracts around what we call type one Medicaid contracts. Um, but we're, we're noting a very significant shift into um, or managed Medicaid plans as well, but probably a little less so than, than Texas. Okay, great. Um, I wanna open it up for q and I think we have, do we have one more question first? Ah, I, I think you address this, but let's just give both of you a chance to comment on it. Are you experiencing greater competition 
now from health systems and other providers that aim to serve your traditional Medicaid patient populations? Ted? I would say uh, some on that as uh, Medicaid is uh, pays better uh, with the new supplemental funding programs. The other thing I'll throw in though, and I clearly, we all know the difference between Medicaid and Medicare. I yeah. would say there's steep competition on the Medicare side, especially with a large uh, increasing penetration of managed Medicare. So that's the bigger issue we're focusing on. Yeah, Art, I'll, I wanna come back to the MA issue too just very quickly, but before we do, just a response to this one, Art? Absolutely, the answer to this is yes. We have found um, in Virginia again, because of type one Medicaid and other state funded plans that, um, that the market is consolidating, you know, and, and people are merging um, in, in the mission to, to serve the population, not just in terms of, of volume and scale, but also in terms of geographic variability. So very stiff competition at this level. Great, and before we go to the Q&A, just uh, starting with you, Ted, about the MA Medicare Advantage programs and how that's playing out for you and in your market. Yeah, so this is an example of how um, payers, uh, they own the full cycle of revenue, right? They have the premium revenue at the top, they can afford to pay uh, physicians who work in that model. Uh, better, and we're finding significant impacts both in terms of attracting people into related ACOs of the seniors. We have a more highly penetrated market on the managed side in this part of the country than is typical, and that success breeds more success. So now it's spilling over into commercial and others. Very attractive model and hard to compete against, including retaining our doctors and keeping them from jumping into that model and being paid well to be a primary care physician managing a geriatric population. Right, yeah, Art? I would, I would echo uh, what Ted has said and maybe even magnify it to say that the four largest healthcare systems in Virginia, particularly those with physician groups, have this as probably number one or number two in their contracting strategy um, for at least the next five years. Right. If we can move to the Q&A question and answer, if you just raise your hand, if you have a question, uh, rather than write it into the chat, it'd be great if we can hear you and see you. So any questions? Other topics that we should be talking about? This is a surprisingly quiet group, <laughs> knowing who's on the line. <laughs> We're monitoring the chat. So if you don't want to come off mute, you can also put your question in the chat and uh, we can have our panelists address it that way as well. So don't be shy. Feel free to put your uh, question in the chat and then also you can um, come off mute and ask your question. Thank you. Well, Ed, if there isn't a question, maybe I'll ask one of my colleagues uh, to learn from him. Um, what would you say are the different strategies that you found to be successful in recruiting a doctor that has had a 20-year career and is um, looking to make a change versus one that's just right out of training? Um, what questions are they asking? Are they different? And how are you meeting that, uh, that generational divide, as, as you spoke about earlier? <laughs> Uh, can I have an easier question? <laughs> <laughs> it gets harder, yeah, no, and harder, a, harder and harder, right, Ted? Yeah, that's a, that's a great one because, you know, folks like that who have been in control for 20 years, I guess it's a function of uh, those individuals. Are they so done with the administrivia of delivering health care that they're ready to turn over the keys to somebody else as long as they have comfort that their opinion will be listened to? And when they made their transition, did they make some kind of money they wanted to, probably not as much as they'd hoped when they leave their practice or sell their practice and come into an employed kind of thing. If they're already in an employment arrangement, it's, it's more a function of uh, what's the compensation, the upside, and whether they want to be highly productive or highly engaged in the community, things like that. So those are all themes, but it's a great question because it's very real world. It's very real world. Cal Calpana? 
Hello, everyone. Thank you for a fantastic session. Um, you have been getting quite a bit of easy questions. So here's another one. <laughs> is, um, our members, essential hospitals, um, have continuously had financial uh, tightness, so to speak. Uh, and uh, is there a role for funding from venture capitals on the innovation side? Are there innovations that venture capitals can fund our hospitals that could help us um, reduce cost, better quality, um, especially so much happening on the AI side? Do you see an opportunity for us? Uh, that's a wonderful question. Who wants to take it first? Yeah, I think Art should take that one. <laughs> okay. I'm happy to take yeah, it. That's a throw it over <laughs> there, Ted. <laughs> I'm happy to take it and I'll, I'll answer it in the way that I answered the prior question about using vendors. I think it's a very similar issue. Um, really knowing your institution, your talent, where you are in that journey, it is, is important. I think sometimes the, the time, the error and the frustration of building is, is best avoided. And I think that, that there are um, funding abilities around um, processes that help you grow certain parts of the market. For example, we know that there are companies now in the space of, of ranking programs, but also creating scheduling programs for those doctors that are highly ranked, right? So now you have an interface where the, where the patient is engaging as a customer, figuring out reputation, and an interface that then schedules directly to you, right? So, so you can't miss out on that boat, right? Particularly if you're trying to build a destination program, as you were saying before. It's, it's unlikely that we would ever build a platform like that internally, germinally, or because we thought about it, but those will be necessary. So my answer is yes. Um, I think there is a role. One has to be very uh, careful about what your internal competencies are. And as my partner said, be ready to say this worked, let's prefer perfect it, or it didn't, nice try, next. Yeah, Ted. That's a great comment. I would I would uh, just add the theme, which uh, which comes up in lots of conversations these days, of predictive analytics. What interventions we can do today to prevent a worse outcome? Tomorrow, there are a lot of different models happening with that. Not always just VC based, but some of our some of our colleagues in different AEH hospitals have some interesting development, creative development along those lines, and we have such a uh, demand for service that is high intensity, that if we can focus on the best patients, both uh, managing high utilizers as well as folks that are maybe a subject to readmission is uh, a really key theme. And some of the those entities are really driving that a lot. So Kalpana, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but what are your thoughts too? Um, I know very little, so I don't know if I should be the one sharing any thoughts or um, comments, but I just feel like there's opportunity that we shouldn't miss out. And what you said about, let's try it. If it doesn't work, move on, um, is the, if we can have that, uh, th that environment to try to move on, um, it, that would be a better option. But as you said, knowing who you're partnering with in the venture capital is probably a bigger question uh, and where that would lead. Um, I just feel like every industry is trying something about AI or predictive analytics. Um, and we have so much data and so much impact in our community, in our population, in our patient. And is there a way to try it out? Yeah, I think, you know, that is really an emerging frontier about how we use that data, healthcare pathways, but also to identify providers, give them the tools to provide the best care and see how they're providing care. Are they ordering the right tests? Are they ordering cost-efficient therapies? Are they monitoring it appropriately? It's transformative in terms of healthcare overall, and uh, will be transformative for health systems as well, the utilization of these tools. You know, Arch or Ted? Yeah, I'll add that um, 
we tend to think of AI and predictive analytics almost as a futuristic item that we're going to be incorporating into our care. It's, it's here, right? It is here. Whether you talk to the dermatologist that's using the ELM to figure out if something's melanoma, whether you're looking at neonatal intensive care and predictive analytics around sepsis, whether you're looking at transportation patterns offered by venture-backed firms that then uh, predict health outcomes, all those three are already here, right? Um, and so, so the question isn't, will it come? The question is, how do you incorporate it? And do you know it's around you? Through, right. I, I believe it's just here. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, even, even at the level of being able to easily grab different physicians uh, diction and things like that when they're um, dictating into the medical record and recognizing voices very quickly and things like that uh, really helps if that's part of the model of any particular health system with that so that's been around here for a few years now and it's really driven by that same methodology so I, I agree it's really here and it's going to change next week and the week after and the week after it's changing so fast yeah, and I think there are multiple implications for this. <clears throat> we have voice recognition software now. Um, this is outside of medicine, but the insurance companies are now using it. So when somebody calls in to connect you with an agent who you're going to have an emotional, psychological connection with, it's going to have a similar background, and it's because they think and know that they'll be able to sell more insurance. Here's a chance for us, for example, to make sure a patient gets together with a physician that's best, that they're best going to identify with, and then have the chance to follow therapy, be more compliant as well. So this matching based on AI, voice recognition is just one example of what's coming forward. But that's, again, one of these transformative technologies. Yes, Ed, and if I may add, I think sometimes in healthcare, we tend to concentrate on a very anchored view of who we think our entire set is, our community, our state, our nation, but we're beginning to, to really note the international presence in, in local management, and whether that is recruitment of foreign medical graduates, right, or whether that's using technology to access workforce. For example, the concept of the virtual scribe and the labor costs associated with that are very different if you employ a national hiring strategy versus an international strategy, you know, strategy. So really continuing to step back and not anchoring your view around what's possible, available, or your real market will continue to be a, a business competency in essential hospital care. Any other questions? I know we're getting near the end of our time. So if not, I, I'd like Art and Ted, just if you have any final comments, anything, we've touched on a lot of topics, very important topics, very easy topics, Ted. We put the bar very, very low for this. But, you know, these have been major issues uh, for AH hospitals and other health systems as well. But just final comments, uh, maybe Art first and then Ted. You know, I'll close with my first comment. I think uh, people who thrive in essential hospitals are mission-driven people. So communicate mission, lead with mission, answer your questions with mission, and then think about everything else that comes after that in the context of that mission so that you really engage and retain the people that frankly take care of our patients. Great, thank you, Ted. Very well put, and I won't be redundant with mission, although I completely agree with that. The other um, thing I'll add to that that is complimentary is we have the opportunity to be the public health, public hospital, uh, you know, raise that beacon and show how things can be done for the benefit of the community that's built into mission, and we can do it in a way that's uh, innovative, right? So we should have AEH and innovation uh, spoken in the same breath, right? That's the way we can best represent ourselves to the communities around. That's terrific. Thank you both very much. I'll turn it over to you, Wendy. All right. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you joining us today and want to uh, let you know that you should fill out the evaluation. It helps us to create additional programming and to incorporate your thoughts and concerns and content that you're interested in uh, going forward. So we welcome you back. 
on August the 2nd, I'm sorry, August 7th for the second session, Advancing Beyond Acute Care Strategy to Solve Operational Challenges. And that's going to be, as I mentioned, August 7th from 2 to 3 p.m. So we look forward to seeing you there for the second part of the series. There's still opportunities if you want to refer this program to colleagues and uh, other executives that you think would be interested. So please do uh, share the information about the Essential Learning Series. And we thank you so much for taking your time to attend and um, talk with us today. Thank you. Thank you.